I don't know how many of you have already read the book, Cersei, but I read it because I wanted to see what kinds of herbs that she was going to talk about in her book. And what I found was she talked about a lot of herbs, sometimes by name. A lot of times she just kind of gave a, a flowers of true being or uh, gave kind of a euphemism for them. And I, I think that that may have been done in part because um, we don't necessarily know exactly what herbs would have been used back then, but uh, also so as to not bring attention to uh, herbs that a lot of which had poisonous uh, backgrounds for them. Uh, in the list that I made here, these were herbs that she did mention by name in the book. Uh, and I have been and read all of the ones that we literally can grow here in Kansas. Um, there are some of them that we grow nowadays for uh, the beauty of the plant or for the pollinators because they're a host plant, but not necessarily for a culinary herb. Um, a lot of herbs that were grown and even used in the book, they were talking about their medicinal properties, which there were a lot of uh, herbs that were used medicinally, historically, that we would not want to use nowadays because with science, we have learned that they have poisonous attributes or they can, they don't necessarily do what people think that they do. So... I made the list, um, hellebore and poppies, roses, crocus, all of these are plants that we uh, like to see their flowers. We don't necessarily think of them as an herb. Um, if you think of the definition of an herb as the general one, which is a useful plant, then herbs can really encompass a lot of different plants, not just the ones that we're most familiar with. But for today, we're going to focus on the herbs that uh, are from the Mediterranean background, but that you can grow and use here. Most of these will be herbs that you're familiar with and that uh, you can use uh, in your cooking, uh, whether that's used fresh or if it's used dried. Um, I'm gonna go through those uh, alphabetically and uh, let uh, the chat box know if you have any questions about them as we go. Lisa, before you get too far in, I just want to make sure that we can't see your screen yet. So if... Oh, shoot. I am so sorry. I knew I'd, I knew I'd mess something up. You were excited to get into it. And I so was. <laughs> it was great listening, but I know you've got a good PowerPoint here too. Okay. Can... You can see That's it perfect. now. Awesome. Okay. Sorry. So Thanks. here's my list <laughs> with the herbs in red that we grow here. Um, I would note the one on poppies. It says sleep in their veins. Anybody familiar with the Wizard of Oz knows that uh, when you get into a poppy field, you lay down and take a nap. So it's, uh, it's even something that we've run across in more modern times for the same purpose. So let's start with the, the culinary uses. When we're adding herbs to our food, one of the things we wanna do is add flavor to it. A lot of times we're trying to limit our salt intake or our fat intake, or we just want to add the flavors. And um, even though these are all herbs from the Mediterranean area, the, these particular herbs, most of them show up in all different kinds of cuisine. It may show up in Mexican cu cuisine or Indian, uh, Middle Eastern, a lot of herbs are kind of universal in that way, and they use them, uh, maybe they grow a different variety of them, but, you know, it, basil is still basil. If they're growing it in the, in the Greek area, they may have a Greek or an Italian or the sweet Genovese basil. basil. If they're growing it in uh, an Asian country to use in cooking, they may use more of a Thai basil, something spicier. So, depending on what kind of foods it is that you like to eat, you can adjust the varieties that you grow. Now, the herbs that you like to put in at the beginning of your cooking uh, are the woodier herbs. So think of like your thyme, your sage, your rosemaries, 
they they have a they're a little tougher kind of leaf and stuff and so when you're putting those in at the beginning of your cooking the cooking process will extract all of those flavor oils from it when you're using the softer herbs like basil parsley even french tarragon a lot of those you want to just put the herb in at the very end so that the heat of the dish will release the oils but not have it have enough time to evaporate um, another way to use your herbs will be to make your sun teas in the summer. And I always tell people, you know, make what you're, whatever it is that you're growing, pick a handful, like a little bouquet of it, put it in your water, put it out there in the sun, brew your tea. Um, it, uh, if you're doing just herbs, it'll be kind of a yellowish greenish color. If, uh, you add actual tea bags to it, you'll get that browner color and you'll have your caffeine. Take a sip of it when you're done. And if you don't really particularly care for the flavor, you don't like that mixture you came up with, then use it to water your plants and start over. It's, you know, you'll kind of trial and error. You can figure out what it is that you like mixed together to make a refreshing beverage. So basils is one of the main ones that a lot of people like to work with and they like to grow. It's a very easy one to grow. There are all different kinds of varieties of them. Um, cinnamon basil, your large leaf basils, you can use uh, large leaf basils as a replacement for lettuce. In your BLTs or in uh, just a regular sandwich, having a leaf of basil in there instead of lettuce just takes that sandwich to whole new heights. Um, a lot of the your cinnamon basil and your lemon basils, a lot of times they use those in desserts or they use them to flavor creams uh, for whipped cream. Uh, the uh, red varieties like purple ruffles and red reuben, uh, it, they have the same flavor as your regular sweet Genovese basil. They just have that color added in the leaves, which makes really nice looking vinegars and uh, your dressings for salads will have that kind of a pink cast to it. Uh, basils are, we're actually going to talk about planting those by seed. They're one of the easier herbs to grow by seed, uh, although they do have some requirements we'll go over. Most of your herbs that, uh, that we're going to talk about today are done with uh, cuttings. So you buy a starter plant and work from that. They, a lot of them don't necessarily come very well from seed or they have a very difficult time coming from seed. So it's easier just to buy the one plant um, and then just let it grow bigger over time. But because basil is an annual, you only have to worry about it for the one year. It's easy to just grow it from seed. Anybody here who's ever used bay leaf, I know you get them in those little canisters and they have uh, the uh, those little kind of brownish green leaves in it and we add it into our soups and stews and let it cook the whole time. But if you ever have the opportunity to use a fresh bay leaf, it is night and day difference. The, the nice thing about uh, bay is it's like a little tree that you can grow like a house plant. You can have it outside during the summer, you can have it inside in the winter. So you always have a supply of fresh bay leaves. Um, because, you know, you never use that many at a time. So the tree will do just fine. Uh, it's not one that's hardy here. If you were down in Texas, you can grow it outside all the time. But here in Kansas, we definitely have to bring it in. But it's not too picky. You do have to watch for scale insects. It has a tendency sometimes to attract those, but they're easily controlled with uh, a little bit of alcohol and a cotton ball. And uh, then you get to have that fresh, fresh aroma and fresh leaf every time you want to use it. I have a lot of people that will ask about growing cilantro. It's a very popular herb. And here in Kansas, cilantro is something we grow early in the spring and then later in the fall. It likes our cool temperatures. It's not real fond of the heat of summer. I know they have some varieties that they've come out with that they say are slower to bolt. And that just means that the way cilantro grows is that once it hits the really hot weather, then it wants to shoot up a flower stalk bloom, 
make seed and then die. And so the slower to bolt varieties are the ones that will not uh, send that flower stock up as early. So if you're using cilantro, grow varieties like that, but also know that you those seeds are an important uh, spice to use also. If you've ever seen or had a recipe that called for coriander, that really is just cilantro seed. So if it, once it goes and bolts and goes to seed, then you just harvest those seeds when they're dry and set them aside to use in your cooking. Uh, just, just know that it's not gonna do as well here in the heat of our summer. Almost any other herb will do fine. Uh, dill and fennel are really popular ones to use. I know we think of pickles when we think of dill, but dill works great in egg dishes. It goes great with fish. It's a wonderful one to add into to make a dill dip with uh, sour cream. Uh, the, uh, the little zip with that is, is such a, a needed use. The, um, the fennel that grows looks very similar to that, but it has that anise flavor, which is a, a, a licorice type flavor. Uh, if you like that kind of a flavor, some people love black licorice, um, then that is a good one to grow and you would harvest and use the leaves the same as you do dill. Uh, the seeds from it is also used in sausage and traditionally in rye bread. But a good part for both of these, even if you just grow them for the swallowtail butterflies, then you'll always have little caterpillars and butterflies in your garden. French tarragon is another popular one. The important thing is you're gonna buy it as a plant. It's not when you start from seed. Uh, if you see a plant uh, or see seeds that say they're tarragon seeds, they are almost never going to be French tarragon. They could be a Russian or a German variety. And those, although they grow and look the same, have no flavor oils in the leaves. So they're just not one for cooking at all. French tarragon is a plant that only gets uh, maybe uh, up to a foot tall, grows well in a container. Uh, it has that same kind of anise flavor, but it pairs really well with lemon desserts. Uh, putting a little bit of French tarragon in a lemon cake just makes the lemon in it pop. Just remember, you always wanna look for the name French tarragon when you are shopping for your tarragon plants. I'm sure everybody here has probably tried to already grow mint, so you may already have your favorite varieties. Uh, a great way to keep mint under control is to grow it in a container. Uh, there's many different varieties, peppermint and spearmint being the main ones, but they have mojito mints, chocolate mints. They have the, the fruitier ones called variegated pineapple or apple mint. Uh, all of those are in the mint family, but their their uh, flavors have just a little bit difference to them. So you can choose the one you like. If you're growing it in the ground and you don't want it to literally take over everything, you can uh, use a big container. Like I, I've used the kind in the demo garden, like you get in the, um, the big trees or the big plants from the box stores and we would just dig a hole big enough that we could bury that pot in it. And then we would plant the mint in it. And that would keep it kind of contained inside that big pot for usually two or three summers until finally the mint would just bust out. And then we'd just pull it up and start over with a new start and parcel out the, the mint. So it's one that can get out of hand. Uh, if it escapes into your yard, I find that it smells really good when you mow. Um, but I also tell people that if you have too much mint, you're not eating enough chocolate. So you need to add, pick your mint, strip your leaves. You need to chop it up really fine and you can add it to chocolate cake, chocolate muffins, brownies, any of those things to mix that in and then bake them. Then you have that chocolate mint and it's, it's lovely. And I think if you're chopping up those kind of leaves, then you're pretty much making um, you're chopping up salad, basically. So it makes the chocolate a health food. So it's a great way to use up your mint and a good excuse to always have chocolate. 
course, anybody that likes to make tomato sauces or pizza, then you're going to want to have an oregano. There are a couple different varieties of oregano. There's one that's a, a hot and spicy oregano that has a lot more bite to the, the flavor than just the regular Greek or Italian oregano. They all grow well for us here. Most winters, they will survive just fine. Um, if you are going to grow in containers and maybe you don't want quite that uh, strong of a flavor, you can always grow the sweet marjoram. It's a little bit more of an annual variety for us. It doesn't grow, um, it is not as reliable as a wintering over uh, as the regular oregano's, but it's, uh, it also gives you that nice flavor um, in the tomato sauce and pizza. Parsley is our biennial herb. The biennial means that it starts the year before so the little plants, you plant them and they'll start coming up in fall and then they'll winter over into uh, the early spring. They'll be one of the first things to green up in your garden or in your containers. And then uh, they will get bigger. And then once the heat sets in late in June or into July, then they will bolt and go to seed. And then that seed will be what you would plant to start your next year. A lot of times if you plant it in a garden area, it will just seed itself and you'll have new little plants come up for you every year. Uh, but it's one that it needs that winter spell in order to get to the point where it'll set seed and, and then die off. If you're doing it mainly for eating, you want for culinary, the flat leaf or Italian parsley is usually considered the best flavored. If you're just wanting it as a decorative edging, or if you're planting it mainly to uh, help the pollinators, then the curled parsley will work just as well for that. Uh, I know sometimes at Botanica, they take the curled parsley and they plant it as an edging along their flower beds. And it's beautiful the way it grows. It's just green, but it's such a, a inter interesting texture on the leaf that it makes a wonderful edging plant. And then it will also be a host plant for the swallowtail butterflies. Rosemary is one of the uh, woodier herbs. It is one that there's only a couple varieties that I would consider to be reasonably hardy here. And that would be Arp or Hardy Hill. They have uh, upright varieties, and then there is one that, that tends to kind of sprawl a little bit, uh, prostrate kind of rosemary. Um, if you wanna have rosemary reliably year round, there are varieties that will grow in containers that you could bring in for the winter and have in a sunny area in your house. Uh, and then you can just pick your rosemary whenever you like. Um, when we have winters like we're having right this red hot moment, uh, some of those herbs that may have been growing for years may take a hit. Most of the Mediterranean herbs are used to growing in a hot environment. So they love that our, our summers are hot and humid. What they don't particularly care for is our winters when they're, they're very, very cold and or we have a lot of moisture which, you know, some, some winters we don't, some winters we're really dry, but some winters when we have a lot of snow cover, then the crowns can get uh, what they call crown rot. So you wanna make sure that uh, your woodier herbs like rosemary and sage and thyme are growing in a really good draining garden soil. And then uh, that will help uh, keep the, the root rot away I know in some uh, books, they'll tell you to mulch with gravel. That's a way to keep uh, material away from the base of the crown that will hold moisture, but not everybody can put rocks into their beds where they're growing it. So just remember if you're mulching around them to pull the mulch back just a little bit around the crown so that the moisture is not held up against it and because it will cause them to rot out. Saffron. Saffron is one of the most expensive herbs uh, that you can buy. And part of that is because it each little flower makes such a, a tiny little amount. But it is one that we can grow here. 
it's a fall blooming crocus rather than a spring blooming. And you plant it uh, in August. Uh, and then when it comes up, uh, it looks just like the regular crocuses we see in the spring, but it gets these little red filaments and that's what you harvest to dry and then use for your saffron. And if you lay out there in your yard with your tweezers and harvest this, you'll realize that's probably exactly why it's as expensive as it is to purchase. It's just not something that can be grown like a regular crop. So if you want to grow it, it's, it's a lovely addition. I know people that love to have that uh, saffron in their milk. They, uh, they, they use it in their dishes. It doesn't take very much. It's an, uh, you just use a tiny bit of it in your recipes, but if you can grow your own and get to enjoy the flowers, that makes up for any kind of uh, high cost that they usually charge for it. Sages are one that people are usually familiar with for Thanksgiving, for, you know, your stuffing that you make every year for Thanksgiving. This is when you want to call in your sage. But sage in and of itself is really great to use in other recipes. It's great with uh, an apple base. It goes good with chickens. Having fresh uh, sage around to add in to dishes is, is something we should try more often, not just keep it on the burner for Thanksgiving. If you're growing it uh, fresh, having fresh sage to use for your Thanksgiving stuffing though is a wonderful thing. If, uh, if you're still using that same can of McCormick's sage seasoning that you got when you got married, it's still sitting there on your shelf, uh, you, can, you have my permission to throw it away. Most herbs when they're dried usually are only good for about a year. Uh, just in time for you to grow the new crop. Uh, they tend to lose their potency after about a year. So if you've had any of those dried herbs in on, in your cabinet now for more than a year, you probably should retire them and get you some fresh. And this year that could mean you growing it rather than just buying a new little canister. Savory. They have a winter savory and a summer savory. Both of those are a great one to use, especially with new potatoes and the fresh tomatoes. Um, it's excellent with beans and peas. Uh, they have kind of a peppery flavor. The winter one is a perennial that will come back for you reliably each year. The summer variety has a very similar taste, has a very similar growth. It just is grown as an annual. Uh, either one of them will grow in a container. I have a container of savory that I've been wintering over now for two winters, and it comes back for me very reliably as long as I give a little protection. Thyme is one of my favorite herbs, and I especially love the lemon thyme, but they have variegated thymes. They have English thymes, French thymes. They have so many different kinds. Uh, in the demo garden, we actually did a, a, a bed that had 12 different varieties and we just let them go. Some of them are a lot more vigorous when they grow, so they kind of shaded out some of the more exotic sounding ones like orange balsam, but they were all a wonderful time to grow and, and the aroma for them and the little tiny flowers that the bees love in the spring is just delicious. Um, as I say, lemon thyme is one of my favorites. It's an easy herb to, to dry and then use throughout the year. It's uh, an easy one to grow. It doesn't get real tall. It'll grow good in containers or in the ground. If you're growing it in the ground, it kind of creates like a little ground cover in your area. Um, so it's an, uh, an easy one to grow if you want to add that into your garden. Of course, now that you've been growing them, what are you going to do with them? I always tell people if you, they're, you know, their big growing season is during our summer. So whenever you can use them straight from the garden, you can just go in when you're cooking and go out to see what we've got coming up in your garden. And you can just trim some off and use it in your cooking. Uh, you can chop it up. You can add it to soups, stews, breads. You can use it on the grill. 
Uh, you can take little bundles of herbs and tie them with string around a wooden handle, like a wooden spoon handle. And then you can use that to dip in melted butter to do your basting on the grill. Um, you can freeze when you have excess that you just can't get eaten fast enough. Then you freeze your parsley, your lovage, your basil. You can freeze them and then use them later to pop into soups and stews or onto vegetables. You can take your basil in, in all by itself or you can combine it with other herbs like parsley to make uh, your pesto. You can freeze your pesto in little containers. I use the little half cup containers um, with the little blue lids. What is that? Ziploc, little Ziploc ones. Uh, and I'll fill it with the pesto and then freeze it. And then when it's ready and I want to have that for dinner, I can just take one of those out, pop it into the fridge in the morning. And by the time I get home from work, it will have thawed out. And it's as if I just made it. It's so fresh. It has that wonderful, wonderful basil aroma. And it makes a treat in the wintertime when we just don't really have basil around. Other herbs that you'll be growing that you'll have a lot of growth in the summers, you'll want to harvest and dry for the rest of the year. Good ones are any of the woodier herbs like sage, rosemary. You can do your thyme. You can dry chives or you can freeze chives. Um, lemon verbena is another one that dries really well. Uh, the other one is to make uh, syrups or jellies. And think of these not just as sweet, like you need to put on pancakes, but you can make uh, savory syrups using herbs to then use to glaze your meats and glaze your chickens and stuff for when you're baking during the winter time. It's a way to prolong your flavoring with your herbs while still using the things that you're growing. Now, if you're wanting to preserve your your vinegar, your herbs, you can do those with vinegars. You can make them using regular vinegar, uh, white wine vinegars. Um, the apple cider vinegar usually has too strong of a flavor, so it overrides any kind of flavoring you put into it. But uh, you can use any kind of com combination of herbs that you like, or you can just use a single herb. You can add uh, little cloves of garlic. You can add um, little strands of chives. You can add uh, other seasonings. You put that all in uh, to your vinegar and let that steep uh, for at least a couple weeks. And then you can use that for your salad dressings. Use it when you're marinating. Um, the addition of rose petals or using those dark red basils will kind of give it a blush color which is also really appealing. Uh, you can also use fruits in your vinegars. Uh, I know a lot of us are familiar with raspberry vinaigrette and one of the ways to make that is to actually have a raspberry vinaigrette, which is a vinegar that's had the fruit put into it uh, to give it its flavor. You can make uh, your herbs in butter. You take your butters and you soften them to room temperature. Then you add whatever chopped up herbs that you like to use. You can use combinations or singles. Uh, you mix a little bit of lemon juice in, you mix it up really good, and then you can freeze it uh, in increments if you like, like for what you would use for a meal. Um, and I, I take them and put them in wax paper and, and kind of roll them up like you make little candies and then freeze those in bags according to what flavor I put into them. So if it's a mixed one, fine. If it's, if it's one that's all time, then I know what I've got. When you are making uh, or grilling a steak, um, uh, having that butter finish at the end, they know they do it in a lot of the fancy restaurants, but it's, it's delicious. And you could do that at home by using one of your herb butters. Um, making jellies, out of your herbs, a lot of times they'll use either a water or a juice base. A lot of times they do a lower lower sugar so that it's more of a savory flavor, but that's a great way to save that flavor and use it in the winter. And then you can always uh, flavor your honeys. Uh, honey, you don't have to boil 
but you do want to warm it up with the herb in it. Let it steep for uh, a while and then you'll strain that herb back out and put the honey back in a container and label it. And then you'll have that flavored honey to use uh, for anything that you like to use your honey in, whether it's to add to your tea or if you like it on your biscuits, anything like that. Another thing with uh, herbs has been the, the increase in people interested in pollinators. And we have four herbs that are very easy to grow that are also host plants for the Eastern Black Swallowtail butterfly. So if you grow any of these plants, you'll find these little teeny tiny caterpillars and they start out really small and they have that kind of a reddish cast on them. Uh, that's the, the little beginning of the end stars. Eventually, you'll get the really large caterpillar, which can end up two and a half to three inches long. They're pretty good size before they make their cocoon. You Usually when you, you see the butterflies around the plants, you'll see the female and she's doing this J with her bottom. Here, that's when she's laying her eggs on the, the little leaves. The eggs are really small. They can be kind of difficult to find, but she'll lay them. They'll hatch into the little red caterpillars, grow to this, and then when they, they come out of their cocoon, they'll be the large butterflies that you see floating around to all your other plants. Any of the plants that we have on this list will be their host plant. And you'll notice that two of them are perennial that come back for you each year, or you can grow the annual variety of dill or the biennial parsley. If you grow a combination of all three, then it's an easy kind of way to always have the plants going. And I, I myself love to use dill, so I always make sure I plant extra dill so that the butterflies and I can share it. They never will kill a plant, although it'll look like they're eating it down to little green sticks. It will, before the next flush of eggs will hatch, the plant will have time to recover and put all new leaves back on. So they, they won't take more than the plant can, can give, but they're just wonderful. Kids love to see these big caterpillars. They're, I mean, they're so easy. They're such a good visual that it's really fun if you have ch killed children or grandchildren coming over to your yard, you can show them your, your little caterpillars you're growing. Uh, and rue is, is one of those. I didn't have it listed with the culinary herbs prior to talking about pollinators because it's really not one that we want to eat. I know in the book she makes reference to rue, but it's considered toxic if it's ingested. And in fact, if you brush up against rue, you can get what they call a contact dermatitis. Sometimes it gives you a little rash. And if you wash with soap and water, it'll go away uh, for the most part. Uh, a lot of times they'll tell you if you're gonna be working around it or weeding and something to wear a longer sleeve shirt just to minimize that contact. But the caterpillars love it. So uh, I do grow it in my garden in an area that's kind of out of the way and I just let them have at it. Um, it's not one that I would necessarily grow with my other herbs. I actually grow it more in my flower bed so that you have the, the flowers, they have that kind of a bluish green foliage, which is a nice contrast. And then the butterflies can have at it uh, when they find it. So we wanna talk some about being able to, to grow your herbs. As I said before, most of the herbs that you grow nowadays and get, you'll get them in a small plant, uh, usually in a little container about this big. Um, and that plant itself will just grow quite large over the summer. It will also, for the most part, they will winter over. All of the ones that I listed that come from cuttings are all perennial for us. Um, if it's the saffron, those will also be perennial for us. So those are going to be things that you plant once and uh, they will come up for you every year. With basil, mints, and dill, and even the parsley, 
those you treat more as an annual. Uh, I know people that plant parsley every year uh, in the spring and then they just grow new plants every year. It is a biennial and it will go through the winter, but they always plant fresh seed every spring or plant a new plant. Uh, your fennel is um, more of a perennial for us here, but it's such an easy one to start from seed that I've listed it um, under the starting of the seeds. You can buy it in the plant form. It comes in both a green variety and a bronze variety, which is kind of a, a bronzy brown foliage, which is really pretty if you want to plant it in with your flower beds. It makes a nice contrasting foliage. And then your bay laurel, you can grow just literally as a house plant, bring it out for the summer. Now, there are some herbs that you can do the container, you know, all of these you can grow in containers because I grow all my herbs in containers. But some of those herbs you can winter over outside with protection or you can bring in uh, and have in a sunny area near your kitchen or in one of your rooms where they get good sunlight, uh, not really hot temperatures. Um, they kind of like it the way we like it, except for basil. And I don't, uh, I don't think that basil will ever do very well for you in the house. I always tell people that it goes so well for us in the summer that you should harvest it, you should freeze it, you should save it up so that you can have it to eat during the winter time, but to not worry about growing it in a container. It never thinks our houses are warm enough. It never thinks we have enough sun. It just usually looks kind of miserable. I know that there are people that are using those arrow gardens. They might have a little better luck because the, the, the light and the heat is very concentrated. Bit, but just in general in your houses, basil is just not a good one to try and grow inside. Um, so that one I would go against. But other, the others I have grown um, a lavender that's container friendly. I've grown rosemary. I've had uh, sage and I've had French tarragon. I've, I've wintered all of those over inside my house and I've also done them in containers outside. When I winter them over outside, I want to give them some uh, protection from our drying winds. Um, here in Kansas, especially in Wichita, it just seems like the wind blows. 362 days of the year. We're always surprised on the two when it doesn't. But that wind in the winter can be really drying. So I have an area I put all my pots up against the foundation of my house. I put some containers around the outside of those that don't have anything really growing in them. They're just the left, you know, what's left over from my annual flowers. And then I just pile leaves in on top of them. And it kind of just gives them a little, it kind of protects them from the the, the drying winds and from the severe cold temperatures. And, and then in the spring, usually later in March, when we start having nicer weather, I'll start uncovering the leaves and exposing them to more and more sunlight. And, and then once it gets warm enough uh, in April, I'll pull them back out of the leaves and put them back out into the yard where I normally grow them and let them have all of their sunshine. So that's just one, you know, one way to winter them over outside. If you're growing them in the ground, you don't normally need to do anything in particular. Um, the, the hardy ones here, as long as they don't get a crown rot, they usually don't mind our dry winters. They don't mind our cold. Um, they're used to that kind of a tough setting. It's just usually too much moisture that'll do them in. You can grow them in a uh, herb garden uh, here, like I have a picture of, where they've grown all different kinds of varieties together. If you've got a, a sunny area in your yard that you want to grow um, all of your herbs in together, then this is a good spot. If you have a vegetable garden, usually your vegetable garden, you're growing things that are annual. Um, so you just want to set aside a spot in your garden that you can treat as a perennial bed and you'll plant your herbs in there uh, and then not disturb them. Uh, the rest of your garden you can turn over and change every year with your tomatoes and pepper plants and stuff, but you would want to leave your herbs kind of separate. If you don't have a place to grow it or if the sunniest part of your yard is not where you could have a garden, 
say it's more in front of your garage like mine, then I grow all my herbs in containers. You can see here I've got, this is my dill plant. I've got strawberries. I've got basil growing behind it. I've got scented geraniums. I've got mint. I have my lemon verbena. I've got lavender, chives, rosemary, another kind of mint. And I think there's parsley mixed in in this container along with some French tarragon covers pretty much all the needs of all the things that I like to cook with. And it's right there, just probably about 15 feet from my kitchen door. So it's really handy for me to go out to snip what I need to cook. You can plant your herbs and grow them in with your flower beds if that's where your area is that has the most sunshine. The only thing I would say to watch is on your woodier herbs uh, to watch the watering around them. If you have an automatic watering system that automatically waters in your area, you might set it so it doesn't hit quite at that area all the time. Um, because as I say, the too much moisture can be a little bit for them unless you have really well draining soil. If your soil is a clay soil, then amending it with compost or creating raised beds is another way to make it very easy to grow herbs. They're pretty forgiving. They don't need any kind of plant food. Uh, even the ones that I grow in containers, I occasionally will give basil some plant food because you know it does all of its stuff in one year, but my perennial ones, I don't tend to give any kind of plant food. Plant food encourages um, accelerated growth, which we look for in our vegetable plants and in our flowers. But in herbs, all that does is make the leaves grow, but it doesn't, it doesn't help with the creating of the volatile oils, which is what creates the flavor for us. So being on the leaner side is really what they prefer. With my uh, herbs that I have in containers during the summertime, when it's uh, July and August and it's always so hot out, I may water them every day. I have holes in the all of my containers for drainage and I will water them every day like I water everything else um, and they'll drain out what they don't need, but it's so hot. They're on my driveway. I don't know if you could see that. It It is asphalt there that it's on top of. So it's sitting on asphalt in the hot sun, it's kind of like walking on the sun out there. So that's why I water those every day. During the other times of the year, like in June or in the fall, when the temperatures are not as hot, I won't water them, but maybe a few times a week. Um, and if they're in the ground, uh, at the most, maybe once a week, if we're not getting any rain. Other than that, they don't mind being on the dry side except for basil. Basil loves a lot of water. It's kind of the prima donna of the Mediterranean herbs, likes everything in excess. So there's your basic requirements. Uh, the well-draining soil here in, in Wichita especially is probably your best bet. Uh, a lot of portion, portions of our town are clay soil. So either doing them in raised beds or uh, doing them in containers of some kind. And you can do a large container. If that's all you have room for is one big container, you can plant multiple herbs in it. Um, I, I always recommend that if you're growing them in containers, never grow in a container any smaller than six inches. Uh, eight inches is, is the kind of the minimum I like to go with because any smaller than that, they dry out so fast and the roots fill it so fast that then it's just kind of an uphill battle trying to keep them watered enough that the plant thrives. So I know some of you took the uh, previous uh, presentation where you're gonna make a little pinch pot. And I was gonna talk with you about how to plant your pinch pot, or if you're not doing a pinch pot, you can plant in other containers. I'm gonna switch to a demonstration. so. Give me a second here to, to get out of my screen share and I'll show you what I got going on. So um, 
they gave me a, one of the little pinch pots that uh, they were showing how to make. Let's see. There we go. This is one of the little pinch pots that they made so I could use it for this demonstration. As you can see, it's not a very big pot. It's uh, probably about three and a half inches across. Um, it does not have a drainage hole in the bottom, so I would need to make some adjustments when I'm growing stuff in it. Um, if you're not using one of the little pinch pots you're going to make and you have any kind of a little container about this size, whether it's a terracotta pot or if it's a little plastic pot, if they have drainage holes in it, then you'll want to make sure you have a saucer underneath it to catch the water. Uh, when you have a container like this that doesn't have a hole in the bottom, then you're going to want to be real careful with your watering and not overwater because there's no place for that water to go. And so then it's like uh, a soup at the bottom. So you, you have to be very a lot more diligent and careful when you're planting in containers without the hole. Uh, but what I do when I'm going to grow them by seed is I have a a potting mix that I use. I know that they make a seed starting mix and if you want to use something like that you can but if you just have a regular potting mix then you would fill your little container and this potting soil is moist but it's not real wet so I would take this opportunity before I put any seeds in it to add some water give it a chance to kind of absorb that water so it's it's a really moist medium. Uh, you can then take it and you could do this to make sure you pour off any extra water and then it'd be ready to plant. For a container this size, you wanna plant uh, like three to five seeds in each one. You only need about a quarter inch of soil then to put on top of it. Um, and then you've got a couple things. You want to kind of make a greenhouse effect. So you can take a Ziploc baggie and put that over it to make a little greenhouse effect with it. Um, another thing that you can do is I get, the, I get grapes in these big containers from Sam's and you could put this in there and treat this like it's a little greenhouse. Um, with basil, it's one of the last herbs to go out in the garden. It does not like its nighttime temperatures to be below 50 degrees. So here in Kansas, that means uh, closer to Memorial Day than uh, the beginning of May. So a lot of times we're putting our tomatoes and peppers and stuff out earlier in May. But with basil, you're going to want to wait to plant them out until after the temperatures are reliably in the 50s. So if you back that up four to six weeks, then you would start your basil seeds inside uh, around the beginning of April. So making your little pinch pots should work out just about right to get those made and fired uh, to get them planted up in the beginning of April. When, um, when you do plant them up, uh, April's still going to be a little chilly at night, so you're not necessarily going to want to put them on a windowsill. Near the windows, uh, are, it gets very chilly at night, and basil does not like the cold. So having them in a sunny window but set back from the window will help. Um, and once they start coming up, uh, you'll want to thin to where you only have two little starts in each pot. Um, they always have you put a little extra seed in it to make sure you get a good germination rate. Um, and then once those start growing, you can raise, you can start with your, your little plastic bag down on it, but you can raise it up then as they get a little bit bigger. And then once the seedlings themselves have gotten uh, the extra sets of leaves, and they're probably about three inches tall, you can start taking the bag off during the daytime. Um, and once the weather outside is getting warmer, you could take them outside during the daytime. You just want to remember to bring them back in 
for the evening and overnight while the temperatures are still cold. So it's really easy to grow basil by seed. And there's a lot of different varieties you can get to try. Um, and having too much basil is usually never a problem. There's always something you can do with your basil. Um, so I just wanted to show everybody how easy that would be to do. And I will put those directions back up on the screen there. There's the, the directions for you to look at on how to grow uh, your basil seeds. And Lisa, remember, while we give people a minute to look at those instructions, there's a couple questions maybe you can help address related to the pinch pots. Yes. Uh, one of our participants said their pinch pot is a little bit more shallow. Uh, it's about two inches tall. And so can the pot be more shallow for seed starting? And do they need to think about maybe planting that up into a bigger pot at some point? Yes. If, uh, if the pot is smaller like that, you can get it started. And then uh, when the the basil is um oh i'm gonna say about two two and a half inches tall then you could take and plant it into a bigger container you don't have to go into a large container you can just go up a size until you're ready to take it outside but uh you can use little tiny terracotta pots the little pinch pots little plastic i mean they come in all different little sizes so if your plant's growing really well and it's still too early to take out, then you could just go up a size and plant it up in a little bit bigger pot. Perfect. And somebody else asked if we knew what kind of seeds we got from the library. And I know, I know we do. Do you remember the name of those seeds? I believe it's an Italian basil seed. I don't know the variety. I mean, I don't know the company. I just uh, was told that it was Italian basil which is the same basically as a sweet Genovese. It's just a name, name difference. It, it would be the, the basil that most people are the most familiar with. It should have really good flavor. Do two more quick questions and then we'll let you finish out and then end up with the rest of the questions. Do people need to tighten that plastic bag when they put it over the pot or can they leave it loose? You. Depends on the size of your container. Like with this one, it made, it wasn't completely tight. Um, what you want is to hold the moisture in, but you don't want to create um, too much humidity in there because it could cause the seedling to mold and, and then rot off. So I usually try to leave at least a little bit of air movement that could get in there so that it holds moisture in, but doesn't create uh, uh, an environment that could cause mold because it doesn't get any fresh air. Perfect. And if somebody doesn't have a sunny window, will fluorescent lights or even grow lights be enough to help those basil seeds grow? You can do them under uh, grow lights, uh, but you want to be really close to the light source. Usually when they're starting uh, seedlings inside with grow lights and stuff, the grow lights are not very far up off of the pots. To part of that is warmth, but it's also for the light. And then they raise the lights up as the plants grow. So it would be the same kind of thing there. Perfect. Well, we'll let you finish and we'll get to back to all these other questions once you're done. Okay. Well, <clears throat> I really just had one more slide. I just wanted to show some other sources for herbs. Here in town, there is a national organization called the Herb Society of America. They have a wonderful website, all kinds of information on it. Uh, if you go to Herbalpedia, they have a, an enormous line of information to find out about just about any herb you've ever imagined. Uh, and I have used it for a lot of my research sometimes. And then we also have a local chapter here that uh, is called Herb Society of South Central Kansas. Normally, in the, in the before times, we would meet at Botanica the third Tuesday of each month. Uh, we do a meet and greet from 6.30 to 7. And then at 7 o'clock, we would do a program. Uh, right now, we're doing those all by Zoom. So um, if somebody is interested, uh, we can... We can, I can get you the newsletter. We can have you join in on our Zooms. 
uh, during the summer, a lot of times, instead of having our meetings at Botanica, we'd have them at, at people's yards or in their gardens and see how they grow their herbs. Uh, it's always a great thing to learn. And then the first Saturday of every May is Herb Day. The Herb Society does that in conjunction with the Master Gardeners. So if you guys have ever been to Herb Day and had uh, the lunch, uh, brunch or the breakfast back there, that, that was us. Uh, stopping by our booth. We always saw a lot of people. We've really missed seeing everybody. So uh, this year they're doing a community bloom and grow uh, that same day in the afternoon. It won't be quite the same, but hopefully next year we'll be back on track with Herb Day the way it's always been. Uh, but I'm always interested in having people join our club and we do have a Facebook page and you can send messages through um, Facebook to me and I'd be happy to answer them. If you have questions about herbs or anything like that, that's another way to reach me. Somebody wanted to know, is dill or fennel okay to grow in a pot? Yes. Perfect. And what time of year would you typically plant those? Most generally with your herbs, planting them in the month of May, uh, or even if we're having warm temperatures, uh, you can even go into the end of April. That's a good Perfect. time to start them. Perfect. You mentioned a lot of different types of mints on the mint slide. And so when a recipe calls for mint, does it mean spearmint or peppermint or either? Unless it calls for a specific kind of mint, usually it's either a spearmint or a peppermint. That's kind of the gold standard for mints. Some people love the spearmint flavor. Some people for pep peppermint, they're interchangeable that way. If the recipe is calling for something specific, um, Sometimes there's some wiggle room on that, just based on what you your preference is. Um, I know a lot of people that like to grow chocolate mint. Chocolate mint is, doesn't have any kind of a chocolate aroma to it, but it has um, those kind of a reddish brown stems. That's why it's an easy one to pick out in the mints. Uh, and that's where it gets its name from. Uh, but a lot of people prefer to grow the chocolate mint. They like it over peppermint. Perfect. Um, we'll do one more question and we've got a lot of great questions here. People though are really interested in saffron. And so if you, <laughs> in order to preserve it, do you need to dry it or do anything special once you harvest it? Once you harvest it, you do need to let it dry. And, and I have a lady in my herb society who is growing it and she really does lay on the ground and use tweezers uh, because it's just those little teeny tiny filaments. She takes them off and lays them on a tray and then lets them dry. And once they're dry, then she puts them into a jar and then puts them up in her cabinet to use. Perfect. Well, we have a lot of great other questions and we're unfortunately out of time. So what we're gonna do, I've got a, those lists of questions here. We'll have Lisa answer those questions and then the library will email those answers back out to the participants as a group. And so that way everybody can still get your questions answered. And uh, there's a lot of great information. So we'll. Appreciate you, Lisa, and we'll turn it back over to Julie. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.